Silence, all stand. A farewell for the Honourable Justice Michael Kirby. God save the Queen. Please be seated. Mr. Attorney. Thank you, Your Honour. First, may I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Your Honour, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to be here today to pay tribute to the Honourable Justice Michael Kirby. And for Your Honour's benefit, I should mention that this is the first time I have appeared as a member of the New South Wales Bar, and it is a great honour indeed that that first appearance is uh, in front of Your Honour. Uh, I know that my former partner uh, and mentor and your friend Roy Turner would be looking down with some pride on, on that. Um, um, Your Honour, um, I should mention that uh, you have de devoted your life to public service. In addition to your distinguished service to the High Court, Your Honour has served as Deputy President of the Australian Conciliation and Arbitration Commission, as the inaugural President of the Australian Law Reform Commission, as a judge of both the New South Wales Supreme Court and also the Federal Court of Australia, and also as president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. Internationally, you have been an ambassador for Australia through your contribution to the International Commission of Jurists, the OECD, UNESCO, the International Labor Organization, and the World Health Organization, and the United Nations. You have gained tremendous respect for yourself, but also our country, uh, on that international stage. Indeed, you will be remembered for bringing a global perspective to Australia's legal system. As a close observer of civil society, you've, you have also sought to put the law in context and to examine how the law operates in practice. Uh, and I take, for example, the time the High Court considered the prohibition on prisoners voting in federal elections. During argument, you inquired as to the effect of those provisions on Paris Hilton had she been imprisoned in Australia. And after a patient and detailed and technical explanation from counsel uh, of the application of the Commonwealth Electoral Act uh, to the then wayward celebrity, you gravely remarked, well, I just wanted to know, I follow these things, you know. <laughs> um, your Honour will also be remembered for, for your dedication to the development of the law and your contribution to law reform especially through your role as the first chairperson of the Australian Law Reform Commission. I know they're very proud of you. And in that context, uh, your groundbreaking work on the bioethics and organ transplants tackled not only the legal issues, but also the moral and ethical dimensions. And you identified early the need for lawyers to engage with the difficult issues thrown up by genetic research. And you said in 1997, for a lawyer like a theologian, it is somewhat intimidating to stand staring at this new era of genetics. The scientists and the technologists rush ahead. The lawyer, the ethicist and the theologian amble slowly along, their heads full of puzzlement at the problems which seem ins insoluble. Yet to do nothing is to make a decision, and that is so apt to uh, so many areas of the law. This commitment to ensuring the law remains relevant to a changing community, a changing world, will continue to resonate long after you leave this building. You will hold a special place in the history of this court. You have been tagged uh, the great dissenter, but in reality you have played a vital part in the development of so many areas of the law, including, for instance, freedom of political communication. And again, uh, with uh, an insightful comment, you described that right as belonging as much to the obsessive the emotional and inarticulate as it does to the logical, the cerebral and the restrained. And unlike one or two politicians who fall into that first category, I look around and uh, exceptions to those present here today, but one or two politicians who regrettably fall into that obsessive, emotional and inarticulate category, uh, you will be remembered as the great communicator. Your judgments demonstrate your strong commitment to explain the law. Uh, and your willingness to speak on a wide range of topics has shown a commitment to demystify and humanise the judiciary. 
and in your speech in 1995 on judicial stress, you, you were among the first, in fact, to tackle the then taboo issue of depression on the bench. And again, insightfully, you said a source of stress for many judicial officers derives from the role expectation and role playing. Judicial officers are expected, as Sir, Sir Ronald McGarry once put it, to be as wise uh, as they are paid to look. And we all I recognise that you do look wise on the bench today, as always. <laughs> Above all, alongside your extensive achievement, achievements and contributions to the law, to academia and to the community, you will be remembered most for serving justice with a bold heart, a brilliant mind and respect for the fundamental rights of all citizens. I know that uh, you once famously listed work as your favourite form of recreation, and well, I hope that your planned quiet old retirement affords you the opportunity to identify a less strenuous hobby uh, and also to spend time uh, with those you love, particularly your partner Johan, but I suspect we're merely seeing the end of one tour of duty before you embark on another. You have for many years carried an enormous workload with devotion and integrity. You will be greatly missed from the bench but welcomed in whatever endeavour you choose to follow. Thank you. Mr. Attorney. Mr Bathus, President of the Australian Bar Association. May it please the Court. On one approach, it would have been very straightforward to prepare this speech. A simple listing of Your Honour's achievements in many areas of law, law reform and human rights would occupy, far, would occupy far more time than has been allotted to all speakers at this ceremony. But such a speech would not grasp the distinguished contribution Your Honour has made to the law much less the humanity and empathy with which you made it. An example of the latter is demonstrated by the manner you, you approach people to speak at this ceremony. To be able to speak is both a privilege and a pleasure. Yet the manner in which Your Honour issued invitations to speak and the enthusiasm Your Honour displayed when the invitations were accepted made it seem as though the speakers were doing you a great favour. Nothing, of course, could be further from the truth, but it does em emphasise and illustrate the great courtesy you have shown to your colleagues and practitioners over many years of distinguished service. The attorney has referred to the many previous judicial and other appointments you have held. I would like to refer for just a moment to your time as President of the Court of Appeal. Prior to your appointment as President, that court was, to say the least, no place for the faint-hearted. If it wasn't accurately described as a ball ring, it took the notion of Socratic dialogue to a level that's never been seen before or since. Your Honour changed that. The courtesy and civility Your Honour displayed to all those who appeared before you rapidly became the norm for the court. That did not mean that submissions were not subject to careful and at times intense intellectual scrutiny. But the manner in which it was done was designed and was effective to bring, uh, bring out the best in those who appeared before the court. That legacy has continued well after your departure from that court. One thing that is commonly overlooked in, is that during your time in the Court of Appeal, Your Honour made significant contributions to areas of the law other than those which are justly renowned. They included areas of contract law and corporations law. For example, in one case, the advanced bank litigation, Your Honour articulated principles which should guide directors in the context of a contested election for a public company board. That judgment is, of course, not nearly as well known as many of your other contributions to the law, but it has, since that time, guided lawyers, the commercial community, and more recently, the takeovers panel, in the manner in which they have to grasp that particular issue, which has arisen increasingly in recent times. Your Honour's distinguished contribution to the jurisprudence of this court is well known and documented. In hearings, you have displayed the same intellectual curiosity and courtesy that has marked every phase of your career. Your judgments, whether as part of, of the majority or in dissent, have always illustrated a concern for principle, human rights and the rule of law. The fact that Your Honour's view on certain occasions has been a minority view on the bench has received no small amount of publicity. Can I just say two things? First, the focus on your dissenting judgment entirely overlooks the contribution you have made to the majority view on, on many, any number of occasions. Second, the work of this court has always involved extremely difficult questions, both of principle and policy. 
Powerful dissenting judgments have a habit of highlighting the issues involved in the making of the decision, indicate where law reform is potentially required and provide to the court a guide as to what, if any, subsequent steps it should take in the, de in the development of a particular area of the law. It is this reason that Your Honour's dissenting judgments have been so closely analysed by courts, practitioners, academics and law reformers. The burdens and pressures of the High Court would seem to encourage judicial monasticism. Not so for Your Honour. Your Honour's extrajudicial oral and written output has always been prodigious. Persons with a normal level of energy simply shake their head in wonderment at how Your Honour is able to do it. If work is not, as the attorney said, work the attorney said was your favourite recreation, one would think it was your only one. Uh, one, of your colleagues on the, one of your former colleagues on the Court of Appeal somewhat mischievous, mischievously and inaccurately summarised your own speech-making prowess in the following words. He loves making speeches. It does not seemingly matter to whom. He will address any conference, association, aesthetic, congregation, reunion, symposium, levee or dining club. The same former colleague, even more mischievously, and I think inaccurately observed, recently he spoke to the lawyer Jirga at Kabul on the message of Islam and to a gathering of senior monks in Phnom Penh on the necessity for silence. <laughs> the, commun the community is lucky that you have not seen the necessity for silence. Your Honour's extrajudicial speeches and writings are not merely well worth reading, but they have made a substantial contribution to the many facets of law, the legal profession as an institution, law reform, international law and international humanitarian law. The legal profession and the community generally are richer for your contribution and secure in the knowledge that it will undoubtedly continue. On behalf of all the independent bars of Australia, can I thank you for your distinguished service to this court and previously and wish you many happy and productive years in the next facet of your life. May it please the court. Thank you, Mr Bathurst. Uh, Mr Corcoran, the President of the Law Council of Australia. May it please the court. It is an extraordinary privilege to appear on behalf of the Law Council of Australia and its constituent bodies to pay tribute to your honour on the occasion of your retirement from the High Court. The Law Council represents more than 55,000 lawyers nationwide and I dare say there wouldn't be a single practitioner among them who is not aware of Your Honour's reputation and achievements. And that speaks volumes about the indelible impression you have left on Australia's legal landscape. I speak on behalf of each and every Australian lawyer in passing on to Your Honour our best wishes as we bid farewell to you. Your Honour is a tireless advocate of legal reform and change, not just as a result of your time on the bench, but also in what I would call Your Honour's extracurricular legal activities. The Honourable Christopher Wiramantri, a former Justice of the International Court of Justice, considers that you are, and I quote, a voice for progress at the frontiers of the law, a tireless worker whose unremitting dedication to the task of making the law a more effective instrument of justice and human welfare often takes you to its very frontiers. From Your Honour's early work on information, privacy and security with the OECD, your service as President of the International Commission of Jurists, through to your role as the United Nations Secretary-General's Special Representative on Human Rights in Cambodia, Your, Hon your Honour has undoubtedly become one of Australia's internationally best-known judges. To help il illustrate Your Honour's international reach, let me relate a story as told by former Federal Attorney-General Michael Lovatch, who is here today. He also happens to be a former Secretary-General of the Law Council. Mr Lavarch tells me that in 2006 he led a QUT delegation to India and there he addressed a group of 39 senior Indian judges. The judges, according to Mr Lavarch, sipped tea and were politely indifferent as he began his speech. An initial foray into the Australian federal system and its similarities with India did little to prick their interest. As he moved on to the subject of judicial appointments, the presentation Mr Lavarch admits was going nowhere. That was, however, until he mentioned the name Michael Kirby. You know Michael Kirby? One of the judges asked. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I was the Attorney General who recommended his appointment, Mr Lavarch replied. 
Mr Lavarch's ordeal was over as one judge after another recounted some interaction with Your Honour. As Mr Lavarch pointed out, if I had a credible claim to have selected Adam Gilchrist into the Australian cricket team, then between him and Kirby, I'm sure I'd be, have been treated as a Raj in India. <laughs> Throughout your career, Your Honour has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to human rights, the rule of law and social justice. A review of your numerous speeches and publications quickly reveals a jurist concerned with issues of human rights, equality and empowering the dispossessed. Your Honour's dedication to these areas has been noted worldwide. In 2000, UNESCO awarded Your Honour its Prize for Human Rights Education. It is worth noting that three of your 11 honorary doctorates have come from nations other than our own. My colleague, Mr Lester Wang, the president of the Law Society of Hong Kong, recently paid tribute to Your Honour in the following terms. To say that Justice Kirby's contribution to the law, human rights and civil society is known and celebrated here in Hong Kong is a considerable understatement. Indeed, we look forward to being among the beneficiaries of what we imagine may be more spare time for his honour post-retirement, as he will be an honoured guest at the forthcoming Commonwealth Law Conference to be hosted by the Society in Hong Kong later this year. Mr Wang also noted that as President of the ICJ in 1996, Your Honour authored an ICJ report encouraging Hong Kong to maintain its vigilance in protecting rule of law, human rights and the independence of the judiciary as Hong Kong moved to resume its Chinese sovereignty. These sentiments have been echoed by Malaysian Bar Council President Ms Ambiga Srinivasan, who stated, Justice Kirby is of course known and respected here in Malaysia, as he is throughout the entire legal world. His adherence to and promotion of the valued principles attached to rule of law independence of the judiciary and human rights have particularly strong significance to the legal community in Malaysia. In paying tribute to Your Honour, Ms Srinivasan went on to say, we have a proud and honourable legal tradition in Malaysia, but at those times where this tradition meets with challenges, a clear, focused and principled voice like that of Justice Kirby's has served to inspire and encourage our commitment to those ideals beyond all expectations. We have been privileged to benefit from His Honour's willingness to share with us in person his considerable legal knowledge and acumen when he has visited Malaysia repeatedly and over a long period of time. The Law Council also recognises your tireless commitment to speaking duties and public appearances. It is truly extraordinary that with all your honours commitments you have time and time again been able to attend so many events in the legal calendar. In this regard, your honour has been a great friend to the Law Council over many years speaking at numerous conferences and events, and has always drawn large and appreciative audiences. Your Honour's ability to captivate a crowd was illustrated in no uncertain terms during the Law Asia Conference organised by the Law Council in the Gold Coast in 2005. Your one-on-one -on -one exchange with Anwar Ibrahim in front of a large audience was memorable for its sensitivity and incredible insight. You displayed your versatility and adaptability a day later as you were called on to address the meeting of the Presidents of Law Associations of Asia, or POLA. Your Honour's presentation on the independence of the legal profession was owing to space constraints held in less than ideal surrounds, a cramped and uninspiring little conference room in the Gold Coast Convention Centre. Your Honour proved that a great orator can engage an audience regardless of the setting or the mood. These are but two examples, but I'm sure everyone here today can recall many, many more. Your Honour has also had a profound impact on a number of generations of Australian law students. Your Honour's commitment to legal education, law students and young lawyers is well known to the Australian profession. Here is what one student had to say about Your Honour. His altruism had, has had an impact on me. Coming into university, many of us had the starry-eyed impression of graduating to a highly paid corporate role. Many of us still aspire to this. However, I admire Justice Kirby for occupying one of the most important legal roles in Australia and yet still making time to make a valuable contribution to the Australian and international community. His involvement in human rights organisations, along with his judicial recognition of international conventions, is impressive. He is clearly passionate about both the law and people. As students, we need people such as Justice Kirby to look up to in shaping our goals and career paths. 
I am told that Your Honour visited Wollongong University in September 2008 as part of a farewell tour. The event was promoted quietly, and yet almost every law student knew that Your Honour was coming. Students, I have been told, skip lectures and compulsory tutorials just to get a glimpse of you in person. People were sitting on the floor, on the stairs and on other people's laps. Clearly oh and had been ignored in all the fuss. All in, all in attendance were encouraged to ask questions free of censorship, and Your Honour answered all of them with consideration, honesty and humour. Such candour made it clear that you did indeed respect this group of students and care about what they had to say. You then waited to meet and shake hands with all. There are many in our community for whom the moment of retirement is the moment when they begin their retreat from lively participation in community affairs. They move from being players to being observers. I've used the word retirement with, great, with a great deal of hesitation, for I suspect that Your Honour is not the kind of individual who simply retires. But I sincerely hope that during the next phase of your life, you do have an opportunity to spend more time with your partner and family. I recall a story related to me about a person who needed to contact you at midday on Christmas Day some years ago. He thought about it for a moment before picking up the phone and dialing your office number. And sure enough, at lunchtime on Christmas Day, there you were at work. Let's hope future Christmas days are far more relaxing. Once again, on behalf of the Law Council, congratulations on your exceptional judicial career and extraordinary contribution to the law and society. May it please the court. Thank you very much, Mr Corcoran. Uh, Mazana Katzman, the President of the New South Wales Bar. May it please the Court. In the President's Court in the Sydney Law Courts building, where Your Honour served New South Wales with great distinction, there hangs a portrait of Your Honour painted by the Sydney artist Jasonia Palatis, which made the final of the 2006 Archibald Prize competition. When I saw it unveiled, I was shocked. I was shocked because it was sombre in tone, a tone I never associated with Your Honour, a man who contemporaneously sported a bright yellow blazer whilst performing a rap accompanied by a hip-hop artist with the curious name of Elf Transporter. <laughs> the portrait is painted in the style of Goya, a style I later learnt Your Honour had yourself selected, having been inspired by Goya's 1823 portrait of Don Ramon Satue, a judge of the Supreme Court of Madrid. When the portrait was unveiled, Your Honour explained your reasons for choosing Goya. His theory of portraiture, you said, was based on his notion that there are two sides to the human face, reflecting the range of human emotions and revealing the ambivalence of the human personality. I wonder, however, whether there is another explanation. In his biography of Goya, Robert Hughes noted that part of Goya's creed, what he called the very core of his nature as an artist, was that he thought nothing human alien to him. Hughes felt that this was part of Goya's immense humanity, what he went on to say was a range of sympathy, almost literally co-suffering, rivaling that of Dickens and Tolstoy. Whilst comparisons are always fraught with difficulty, these features of Goya spoke to me of Your Honour, a man whose long judicial career has been marked by immense humanity, a range of sympathy, almost co-suffering, to whom nothing human is alien. In the High Court, Your Honour expressed this humanity through judgments that drew on international law and decisions from other jurisdictions, whatever was necessary to reach a just result, always zealous to ensure that fundamental human rights were protected by the law to the fullest extent possible, sometimes drawing criticism, even scorn for so doing. There are many examples of this, and this is not the time or the place to deal with them. However, I do want to mention one of Your Honour's judgments, a personal favourite, a judgment you delivered when still on the New South Wales Court of Appeal. This was the judgment in the case of CES and superclinics, a case brought by a woman who had been the victim of repeated failures by a number of medical practitioners to diagnose her pregnancy 
and in which the court held by a majority of two to one that negligent advice resulting in the loss of the chance to have a lawful abortion could give rise to a claim, to a claim for damages. Your Honour, Your Honour was one of the majority. Your Honour's judgment is both a fine piece of judicial writing and a testament to Your Honour's humanity. The empathy it displayed and the sensitivity it demonstrated put me in mind of a comment that Charles Dickens once made after praising scenes of clerical life by George Eliot. And I quote, if those two volumes, or a part of them, were not written by a woman, then I should begin to believe that I am a woman myself. Perhaps it is only fitting that Your Honour should be replaced on this bench by a real woman. <laughs> Your Honour has made an extraordinary contribution to the law, to the legal profession, and to the lives of so many aspiring lawyers. In recognition of that contribution, I am delighted to be able to announce here that the New South Wales Bar Association has offered you and you have accepted life membership. On behalf of the New South Wales Bar, I congratulate Your Honour on your service to this court and to the Australian people, and I wish you well for the future. May it please the court. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Now I ask uh, the Honourable Thomas Hughes, QC, who was with me in uh, December 1974, when I was first welcomed to judicial office, to say some closing words. <laughs> May it please Your Honour, for me it's a very happy coincidence that having in 1974, as the then President of the New South Wales Bar Association, welcomed you on the occasion of your first appointment to the bench, that I now have the honour of a speaking role in this farewell ceremony to mark your impending retirement as a justice of this court. It would be otios, Your Honour, for me to utilise this ceremony to summarise what Your Honour has achieved conscientiously, effectively and with great distinction in so many spheres of useful human activity that Your Honour's career has spanned. Your Honour has devoted yourself to public service of a very high order, not confined to the execution of the judicial offices you have held. It is all there on the public record. Let me say something about your principal characteristics in terms of judicial behaviour over many years of office in the New South Wales Court of Appeal and this court. It has been a happy amalgam <coughs> of dignity without any trace of pomposity, of courtesy and of willingness to engage in amicable discussion with counsel to elucidate the problems thrown up by the case in hand. To appear as counsel before Your Honour has always been a pleasure to anyone who had mastered the brief. Even those who had not done so through inability to perceive the full import of the issues did not receive at Your Honour's hands the sort of rough, even brutal treatment meted out to counsel by appellate judges of an earlier era uh, well within memory. Your Honour will probably look back on your 12 years as President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal as the most agreeable period of your judicial life. It was an era in which you gave real leadership to a large court whose members possessed and deployed a variety of talents. It was an efficient working court and Your Honour played a very large part in making it so. As to Your Honour's service as a Justice of this Court, 
it has been as long as your service as President of the Court of Appeal, there has been a tendency to depict you as a sort of judicial Robinson Crusoe marooned on a desert isle of lonely descent. As Your Honour has correctly pointed out, however, with unerring accuracy, there is a very large element of exaggeration in this assessment, so large as to falsify the depiction. And in this connection, it is appropriate to remember that on issues of great importance, dissent sometimes turns out to be accurate prophecy. Witness Lord Atkins' famous dissenting speech in Liversidge and Anderson. Now, when I welcomed Your Honour to the bench, I described you as urbane, which I thought was an appropriate description of one of your many good qualities. The shorthand writer misheard me. The transcript recorded me as having described you as vain. <laughs> that adjective was a complete misdescription, for Your Honour has combined great intellectual power with self-effacing modesty. Your Honour's ego has always been very understated, which is a most endearing characteristic. Given Your Honour's voracious appetite for work, it is impossible to envisage your withdrawal from all forms of useful public activity. Anybody who thinks that is thinking in the clouds. The strong likelihood is that any such cessation will be of very temporary duration. However, may your release from the exacting demands of service as a justice of this court be enjoyable. I'm sure, Your Honour, that I speak for everyone in this courtroom in expressing best wishes for the future to yourself and Mr. Johan van Vloten. If Your Honour, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Hughes. Attorney General, Mr. Bathurst, Mr. Corcoran, Ms. Katzman, Mr. Hughes, uh, judicial, uh, law reform, academic, and other colleagues, family and friends. I want to start by honouring the people of Australia in all of their diversity, most of them entirely unaware of what we do here today. Fortunate is the land that lives in confidence under the rule of law with elected parliaments, uncorrupted officials, and independent judges. I honour the Indigenous peoples of Australia as you have, Attorney. So long neglected, it is here in this very room, before my time, that Mabo was decided, demanding that we enter into a new relationship. I have tried to be faithful to my understanding of that decision in the cases that have come before me. I honour the Parliament up there on the hill. I am grateful that so many busy members of Parliament, past and present, from all of the major political parties have done me the honour of coming here today. I also honour you, Attorney General, not just for the high office that you hold, but for the good things that you have recently done. In my last days of judicial service, you led the Parliament with virtually no opposition in the end to remove unjust laws that affected me and my partner. What some said uh, could not be uh, corrected or was not a priority, you and members of the Australian Parliament addressed uh, with justice. I express my thanks to you and also to the members of Parliament. 
I acknowledge the presence here today of the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, Leader of the Federal Opposition, who, as a cub reporter so many years ago, taught me how to sell law reform. I also honour uh, the Honourable uh, Bob Debus and other ministers, and Senator George Brandis and Senator Bob Brown. They all do me a great honour by being here with us today. I thank you, Mr Bathurst, and the members of the Australian Bar Association. How many times over the decades you and your colleagues have appeared before me in courts across this continental country. As Chief Justice Brennan used to say, advocates are ministers of justice, guardians of law and rights. Despite my best endeavours in Daughter Econiaca to terminate the legal immunity for workers' advocates, which efforts failed, the Australian Bar will honour me tonight with life membership. For their charity and forgiveness, I will <laughs> treasure that gift. I thank you, Mr Corcoran, speaking for the universal body of lawyers throughout Australia. Even before I joined the Bar, I was a clerk and a solicitor for nearly a decade. On every working day, I looked across my desk at anxious clients and their witnesses and families, and I never forgot, never forgot, that from that moment on, throughout their lives, I would be Mr Kirby, their lawyer. I thank you, Ms Katzman. I wish that during my 13 years uh, on this court, I had heard more women from the central podium of the court. The Honourable Mary Gordon QC and the Honourable Michael McHugh, a Companion of the Order of Australia and QC, my former colleagues, do me the honour of being here tonight, today, and I thank them for their attendance. They, like me, always knew, as Justice Gordon used to put it in her direct manner, that talent in the law and in advocacy is not found only on the Y chromosome. <laughs> I cherish the additional award of the uh, life membership of my home bar. It's specially precious to me because I did not have the usual journey uh, to become a judge. I will always be happy in the presence of the bar. You, Mr Hughes, as we have reflected, were at my coming in and now at my going out. You have been a great performer in many of the acts in courtrooms during my long drama. Lawyers love ceremonies. It's not just the vanity in us. Ceremonies like this help to cement our corporate life and to remind us that every one of us is but a temporary traveller in these parts. Your presence, Mr Hughes, reminds me of how the Duke of Edinburgh said he felt on the 80th birthday party. He said that he'd not expected his mother-in-law would still be there, aged 101. <laughs> <laughs> I congratulate you, Mr Hughes, on your own recent anniversary uh, at the bar, which bodes well, and I promise to be there uh, at your next one when I am 101. <laughs> I'd mention, Attorney, the presence uh, in this courtroom, not only of your wife, Michelle, but also of your father, the Honourable Doug McClellan, Companion of the Order of Australia, former Senator and Minister of the Commonwealth. In Kylie Tennant's biography of Herbert Veer Evatt, part of your father's condolence speech to the Senate is recorded. The thing that your father recounted was not Evatt's mighty achievements, as one of the most brilliant scholars in the history of this country, the youngest ever justice appointed to this court, and the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was brought into operation. Instead, it was his empathy to ordinary Australians, whom he called the little people. No public official could hope for a prouder badge of honour than that. And by his presence today, the Honourable Doug McClellan links everyone in this courtroom back to Dr. Evatt, back to 1929 when he was appointed to the court, 
Ebert's memory and that of the great portraits that are around us remind us of the history of the court and its service to the Constitution and the people of Australia for over a century. I'm grateful that for the first time, I think, heads of the national cultural institutions have joined us on this occasion. The National Library, the National Archives, the National Museum, the National Gallery and the new National Portrait Gallery, our neighbour. I cannot understand how anyone would not love Canberra. It's a great pity, in my opinion, that the architects place most of the judicial chambers on level nine of this building facing the airport. <laughs> this, this plants sullen uh, thoughts, escapist thoughts, in the minds of the justices. Chief justices look out on the lake on which they are reputed to walk. <laughs> From my windows, I have watched the Brindabellas with their changing colours, the trees and the bright stars at night, Walking to and from work in the different seasons in Canberra has been a special joy of my service here, and I will miss it. Best not to be too cut off from reality. A life in Commonwealth cars is not a good look. I honour my judicial colleagues, including the Chief Justices and judges, federal and state, who are here to send me off. My friends from the Australian Law Reform Commission, and the independent judicial and professional bodies. I thank the law officers at the bar table here present uh, for being here. Perhaps some of them are here on instruction to check that I am really going. <laughs> well, they can signal back the eagle has landed. I pay tribute to the faithful staff of the High Court of Australia here and in other cities. Uh, and the successive chief executives, registrars, librarians and court officials. To my own personal assistant of 20 years, the wonderful Janet Sarley, prudent, feisty, wise. To many associates from this court and from the Court of Appeal, who I see in front of me. They've travelled here and we had a merry dinner last night, and I am proud of each and every one of them. To Justice Virginia Bell, my esteemed successor, who also does me the honour of attending today, I extend good wishes and encouragement. She will take over my chambers. She will now have to look at the mountains and at the changing seasons and at the stars at night. She began her journey in the Redfern Legal Centre in Sydney, so she's most unlikely ever to forget the way the law is viewed and affects Doug McClellan's little people. But I warn her here and now that if that unlikely moment ever, ever arise, arrives, the ghosts of William Dean and Michael Kirby, who are in that room and haunt it, will come down and whisper in her ears. The court had the room varnished again last week, I know not why, <laughs> but the vibes are in the room and they will remain. They're in the ether, they're in the law books, and they cannot easily be varnished away. <laughs> my father is here with me today, together with my brothers Donald and David. My sister Diana could not get the day off nursing colorectal patients at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, but Julie, her daughter, is here. I honour my wonderful parents and my family. My father, who is 93 this month, is sharp as ever and still driving. In fact, he had to be restrained from driving down here from Sydney. For those of you who have enjoyed this ceremony, and like President Obama, think it was so much fun that it should be repeated. <laughs> I regret to say that the state funeral is postponed for three decades. But that's not to say that I don't want one in due time. <laughs> On past occasions, when I've come to this point in so many speeches of this kind that I've given over the years, I have referred to my debt to unnamed loved ones. 
my fearless sisters-in-law would then dig my partner Jan van Floten in the ribs and let him know that this was him. He was on. Well, those times are over. Johan has been a great strength to me during my time on this court and all the courts before and for very long. He has occasionally had to absor absorb unkind blows, which he has done uh, without complaint. A steadfast rock throughout all of my judicial years. And today I can thank and praise him publicly in your presence. And next week we celebrate 40 years together. In the interval between my swearing in and now, many good things have been achieved in Australia, including some in this place, to improve the position in law of those whom I mentioned at my welcome in 1996. Aboriginals, women, homosexuals, Asian Australians, non-English speakers. Challenges remain, of course, and there are completely new injustices to overcome after today. In the courts, the noble struggle for justice is never completed. My departure allowed me to permit a lot of papers uh, to send them to the National Archives. And at my request last month, they gave me access to my ASIO file. <laughs> I combed through the insubstantial records of long forgotten trivial activities in student affairs in the Council for Civil Liberties, Mr. Murphy note this, and other innocuous events far away and long ago. And suddenly my eyes fell upon a report of an unidentified agent's conversation with my great aunt, <laughs> Gloria Bowes. She was a close friend of Jessie Street. She was what we would now call a progressive feminist. She had some communist friends and I, I imagine that that was why she came under surveillance. She died in 1993. In the conversation, my Aunt Gloria is reported as having said, Michael Kirby is very brainy, but he is a reactionary. <laughs> Somehow, this didn't seem to square with all that talk about judicial activist, maverick, great dissenter, so I thought about it. And actually, my aunt, who was very intelligent, may have been on to something here. You see, I could never get out of my mind the notion that the law of our country is basically an instrument for justice, that its inevitable tendency is to bend towards justice for all, that it would not likely condone a constitutional interp interpretation oppressive to the little people in Australia, and that our law is generally fair and rational, and that where it's not, parliaments or the courts have their responsibility to step in so far as they can and to make it so. And when you analyse these thoughts of mine, they're truly very reactionary thoughts indeed. They exhibit a touchingly naive faith in Australia's basic institutions. And it's a faith in which I have never wavered during all of my judicial years. Tonight at midnight, I'll put away this black robe. But it's a trifle, nowhere near as grand as the scarlet and ermine robes of earlier days. Those robes remain portrayed in oil in the National Portrait Gallery next year, and they'll be there long after I've left this place. I'll shed the title of justice that I've carried with me as a reminder of my vocation these past three decades. I'll return to the title of a citizen, Mr. There's no prouder boast in the world than to be a citizen of Australia. I'll leave this building tomorrow, but I know that in the hands of my colleagues and Justice Bell, the work of independent judges will go on. My staff will depart with me, but I'll stay in touch with them, as I will with many of you here present. The future is unknown territory, but I'm entirely confident about it. Taking a taxi last week 
the driver engaged me in conversation. I read you're being forced to retire. <laughs> yes, the Constitution requires it at 70. There was a long pause, and I waited him for him to say, but you don't look 70. <laughs> He never did. <laughs> How does your father feel? He knows that I go there every week. How does he feel about having a son who's retiring and at 70? Well, actually, and this is the truth, he keeps asking me if I've registered yet at Centrelink. <laughs> Another pause. But there's always been a Justice Kirby in Australia. He may have been thinking of Sir Richard appointed a judge back in 1948. There still will be, said I, thinking of my brother David. Well, we're going to miss you. You mean you'll miss my cab fare? I'll be back on the buses. <laughs> After I alighted, the driver rode, drove off at a very melancholy pace into the distance, and I can swear that I saw tears streaming down his cheek. <laughs> so it will be with some of you. <coughs> Though not, I suspect, all. <laughs> the High Court of Australia will offer hospitality for many after the silk ceremony at 3.30 this afternoon. But for those who can stay only for a short time in the Great Hall, I'd like to greet you personally when I rise. I thank everyone for coming today to ease the passing. And so for the last time I give a direction as an Australian judge. Directions like orders and judgments. So many of them, so many years. They seem so natural and familiar. So let this last direction hang in the air as three decades roll away and my new life begins. Adjourn this occasion to the delivery of judgments in the full court this afternoon uh, in number two court. All stand. God save the Queen. <laughs>